Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Welcome to episode 107. This week's guest is Matt from HostelGeeks.com. And he fell in love with travel and foreign lands as a young child when he was on a family vacation with his family. Being bitten by the travel bug early meant that he was able to tailor his life decisions around travel and the lifestyle they wanted to create for himself. Originally from Germany, he moved to Barcelona after falling in love with the Mediterranean Sea. And about two years ago, decided to start incorporating even more travel into his life recently selling almost everything that he owns, including his residence in Barcelona, to now being 100% location independent and nomadic. You're going to hear all about that journey today, as well as some of his travels. He does have family in France, so he has spent a significant time there. And if you've listened to any of the previous episodes, you're aware that I'm kind of obsessed with Paris and France in general, so of course I had to talk to him about it. And he has some wonderful insights having spent so much time there. You're also going to hear about his time spent in the Canary Islands this past winter, the adventure activity he took a chance on in Switzerland, even though he's not all that big into adventure, an unsettling experience he had in Jericho, the things he does to prevent being a victim of theft or scams when he's traveling to new areas, the challenges that he's had to deal with now being fully location independent, and his advice for anyone looking to transition into a location independent lifestyle for themselves. Let's go ahead and jump right on in with Matt. Well, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm super excited to talk about your business, HostelGeeks.com, which we are going to dive way into in part two, because I know everyone listening is just going to love it. But first, do you mind giving me a little bit of background on just kind of who you are, how you grew up, and, you know, your transition into this location-independent lifestyle you live? Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really nice to, to be on the show. Thanks for having me. And I'm glad to, to share um, yeah, the insights to my life, to my location-independent life, to hostelgeeks.com. So, um, yeah, my name is Matt. I'm the guy behind um, HostelGeeks.com, which is a website network for premium hostel, upscale hostels. And we are awarding five-star hostels all over the world based on transparent criteria. So where are you from originally? I'm from Germany originally, and I lived the last six years in Barcelona, Spain. Okay, awesome. And when were you first bitten by the travel bug? Did you take any trips as a child or in university or anything like that? Yeah, it's actually quite funny. It was I I was around 11, 12 years old and it was my family we were traveling to Costa Brava, which is around 100 kilometers north of Barcelona. It's the Mediterranean Sea and I remember it was the very first time I I've, I've seen the Mediterranean Sea and I turned around and I told my mom, "Well, one day I will live here." And yeah, that was I think the moment I realized that that I'm really fascinated by by everything which I do not know, which is not my own my own heritage, my own language, and um, I always admired people who spoke uh, several languages. Yeah, that's why I was like, okay, if I want to do this as well, the easiest way is go out there and speak to people. And so, obviously, you fell in love with Spain and the Mediterranean Sea at an early age, but you said that you ended up moving to Barcelona. Was that for business or pleasure? Uh, yeah, it was actually uh, both, definitely both. I uh, never took any decision in my life um, simply for business. I really enjoy uh, enjoying life. And um, yeah, I had the opportunity when I finished my... Actually, I was still studying in the university. 
and I got an offer for uh, for a job in Barcelona. At a, it was an agency. It's about um, budget accommodation. And yeah, at the end, I took the job and I traveled three, four times back to Germany just to finish a couple of exams and to, to present my thesis. And that's about it. And uh, I finished everything in Germany and uh, moved completely to Barcelona. And yeah, that was now six years ago. Okay. And so what was the transition that led you to not necessarily living full time in Barcelona, but incorporating more travel into your life? Yeah, it was always clear to me that I wanted to have my own thing going. It's uh, the own business, to have the freedom to do things I was the way I wanted to. Yeah, that's why at one point I decided, okay, well, I, I tried several things. And at one point I realized, okay, this is what I'm doing right now. HustleGeeks.com, that's, it's, it's working. People really enjoy it. People use the website. People ask questions about, hey, um, where should I stay in? New York, in Amsterdam, in Berlin. So I said to myself, well, you know, if, if you don't want to go this step right now, it's the moment. And the funny thing is, you can always go back. If you're good at what you're doing, there's always a job available for you. And so I thought, okay, I will take the chance. And yeah, here we are almost two years later. And it worked so far. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> so in that two years since you've made that transition, Mm -hmm. What has that been like for you? Have you been traveling full time? What locations have you been to? Just kind of run us through what your life's been like since you made that change. Yeah, I, w I was still living in Barcelona as my as my home base the last two years. And I was always traveling around um, Europe and North Africa. And all the time when I traveled for longer term, I uh, rented out the apartment. And over the winter, I was living on the Canary Islands. Yeah, and that's perfect, actually, because um, it's it's easy in the Schengen area in, in, in Europe to move around and to live at different places. So that makes it very easy. And uh, now, around two months ago, we sold everything, so apartment, everything we have. And uh, yeah, since then, we are completely 100% location independent. And that's uh, quite different than having actually a home base where you know, okay, well, you know, let's go home again, get some rest and uh, continue another travel in a couple of weeks. Right. There's still a, at least some sense of security there when you have a home base to go back to. So what's that been like for you getting rid of that security base and now just being completely nomadic? Actually, uh, it was quite interesting. A lot of people always asked, oh, okay, are you excited whatsoever? And my reply always was like, well, I don't know. I'm too busy to think about it. I didn't even have the time to think about, to mm -hmm. get nervous about anything or to get excited. Obviously, I, I was excited, but yeah, I didn't really have the time to really feel it. And now that we uh, are on the road, it's freeing. It's absolutely freeing in one way that you, yeah, you don't have the obligations whatsoever. But I think the hardest challenge, to be honest, of not having the home base is missing missing my friends back home because that was always something you can really disconnect from the work you're doing because when you're on mm -hmm. the road you meet new people you need other you meet other digital nomads and you always end up talking about the same things more or less and back home with the friends it was quite different you know you can just uh, meet up for a drink or go and play some sports or whatever so that was that was quite different that is quite different uh, the biggest difference right okay so besides not having your friends and just kind of that stable group of people in your life, have there been any other kind of just more difficult things to make adjustments to as far as the traveling itself? Have there been any kind of logistical changes you've had to make or ways that you've had to plan differently? Do you have to plan further in advance? Just what's that been like? Yeah, we had to plan a lot of time in advance. Simply because um, for us, um, with Hustle Geeks, it's obviously important where we are staying. And so we had to contact our hostel partners all over um, Central Europe and telling them, hey, guys, so in two months, three months, we would come. Do you have uh, some, some beds available for us? Can we stay with you whatsoever? Because, um, yeah, for us, it's important where we stay. So if we're going to, to Amsterdam and we uh, do not stay at our five-star hostel in the city, well, that's uh, then what's really the point of us going there? Right. But that worked out really well because at the end, I guess it was also partially luck. I don't know. 
But one one big challenge at the very beginning was uh, to get comfortable at the working desk because I didn't have a working desk anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to find your your working space. You have to see where you get your good coffee, a comfortable seat. Um, The Wi-Fi maybe doesn't work that well. But at the end, once you're in it a couple of days, a week or two, um, you know what you suddenly really need and what you just think you need it. Right. And yeah, so I found my way around it. Um, The only thing I did not figure out so far is how to have good coffee on the road. But (laughs) I'm on it. (laughs) You're on a mission. I'm I'm on a mission. Yes. Maybe I will call myself, I don't know, coffeegeeks.com. Let's see. (laughs) (laughs) There's probably a market for that. I'm sure there are a lot of digital nomads who are missing their good cups of coffee. And it's an addiction. So maybe maybe there's good money to make. I don't know. Right. (laughs) Okay. So I'm kind of curious, you mentioned you were in the Canary Islands over the winter, and that's not any place that's ever come up in the podcast before with any of my guests. So do you mind talking about that a little bit and just what it was like there and what you enjoyed? Oh, yeah. It's, um, the, the Canary Islands are just amazing. It's, it's, really, it's really, really, really amazing. There are different types of islands, and we were on Fuerteventura, which is um, yeah, a semi-desert at the end of the day. And it was, uh, yeah, it's perfect for, for uh, water sports. And yeah, to have a lot of volcanoes and it's, it's, it's really, really, really beautiful to visit. And it was quite funny that we were looking for an apartment to live there two months. And uh, we sent a couple, uh, a couple of emails and people told us, yeah, sure, you can stay at our place. It's just 2,000 euros for a full month. That is, yeah. <laughs> that is just <laughs> ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And I was like, that's not reasonable. I can move, I don't know, uh, to other places, but not the Canary Islands for this money. And it's important to mention that the Canary Islands are actually really cheap. You know, the restaurants are way cheaper than in, in, in Barcelona or any other destination across Spain. So we ended up contacting a really nice guy through Couchsurfing, but not to stay there or sleep there, just to get information. Because I'd, I'd send him an email and say, hey, guy, do you know anything? Do, can you help out or whatsoever? And at the end, we, we Skyped and he was like, hey, guys, I don't know. I like you. You could stay with us. And we were like, OK. And yeah, at the end, we had an amazing time, two amazing months. Also, other creatives uh, were staying with us. So it was at the end, it was like a co-working space. So right. that was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the restaurants are cheap, which was also really amazing was uh, after work or I always said, okay, at one o'clock, I want to be surfing. <laughs> yeah, that so worked. And you know, if you had a really bad day and in a, b- a bad mood, you just went and there were high wa- waves. And yeah, when you left the water, that you had a good mood again. That's great. <laughs> I mean, obviously you like to surf. What are some other activities that you like to do when you travel around? Do you feel that you're a pretty adventurous person? Mm, to be honest, uh, the adventurous person in, in Unhosted Geeks is definitely Anna. <laughs> I may sound adventurous, but um, compared to Anna, I'm not. We have been recently to, to Interlak. It's, uh, it's a European sports capital in, 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 uh, in Switzerland, central Switzerland. And there you can do amazing sport activities like skydiving, hang gliding. And uh, yeah, so Anna was jumping out of a plane 4,000 meters I don't know that in miles. I don't know. I'm sorry. And uh, we actually made a video and I think I was more nervous than she was. <laughs> so yeah, she is adventurous. I would definitely be with you. I, I like to hike. I like to do certain things like that, but you'll never get me jumping out of a plane unless it's literally because my life depends on it. So. <laughs> but ha- have you ever tried hang gliding or paragliding? I have not. Well, I did. I did paragliding in the Gulf of Mexico once okay. when I was in high school. How was and that, that actually, surprisingly, it was very, very fun. But I think, I mean, I was still attached to something. So I think that's what made me feel a little bit better. We were still, because we did it over, the, you know, in the ocean and, or actually the Gulf. And, you know, we were attached to the boat. And so they kind of did all the work for us. And we mostly just got to hang out in the air. Ah, so you did it with the boat. You were behind the boat and they were, ah, okay, okay. Right, yep. And they just pulled us along. And it was, it was fantastic. But again... For the most part, there was little risk involved. I mean, if we, if something happened and we fell, we would just fall into the ocean, which I'm deathly terrified of anyways. So that would have been terrible. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's not quite the same thing as, you know, hang gliding or paragliding, you know, from cliff jumping or anything like that. Yeah. You should definitely try hang gliding. I did it in, in Interlaken and I was so nervous. I 
talked so much to my guide <laughs> and he calmed me down. He was like, you know, you know what? Yeah, I get it and whatsoever. And then right before we left, I was like, okay, Peter, you know, I'm pretty sure you got this. And that was amazing. The moment we left, uh, our, our f- uh, foot, uh, feet left the ground. Mm-hmm. Amazing, really. It, it didn't scare, uh, scary at all. I said it was absolutely building and, and it felt like being a bird. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's, that's a really good start for those kind of sports. But I wouldn't uh, have considered <laughs> skydiving <laughs> at all. No, no, no. Right. So hang gliding, it's, it's more like you actually are flying and not just that you're falling at a, you know, not quite a steep an incline. <laughs> no, not at all. It's really, it's, it's, it's like a bird. I think that's, that's the most accurate thing which comes closest to, to a bird. Um, you're just, just, yeah, gliding over the, yeah, over the city, in this case, Interlaken. So that was really, really amazing. Definitely recommend it. Okay, well, maybe I will consider that one day in the future. Then. Yeah, let, let me know how that goes. <laughs> Definitely. So I'm kind of curious. I want to hop over to France now. I kind of have this this love for France. Uh, we actually went to Paris for our honeymoon, and I, mm. I would move to France tomorrow if I could. But what was your experience like there? It sounds like, did you, did you live there for a period of time? In, in France? Yes. Yeah, we are right now in France. Half my family lives in France. So, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with France. <laughs> what else to say? I mean, uh, the, the area I know best is uh, the area, the Alsace, the area with Germany, this border. Mm-hmm. And so where are you at in France right now? Uh, right now we are in a, in a small town next to Strasbourg. Yeah, it's a tiny little town in the Vosges Forest or National Park. By the way, Strasbourg, if you ever have a chance... You should definitely visit. It's so gorgeous and absolutely non-touristic. Oh, really? That's, yes. That's it's, good. It's, I mean, it's that's gorgeous. Paris is wonderful, but it is the number one tourist destination in the world. So yes, there's obviously some drawbacks to that. And we didn't have time. We were only there for a week, so we didn't have time to get out of the city. But that's that's my next goal. We wanted to visit Normandy and, and a couple of these other smaller towns just to kind of get the full French experience. Yeah, definitely. So that's the funny thing about France. Actually, every single corner is gorgeous and very different. Mm-hmm. The area around Toulouse, uh, Normandy, uh, South France, Alsace, they're all very different. Very, very different. And every single one is worth it to visit. Right. And so is Strasbourg your favorite place that you've been to in France? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. By, by far. I think Strasbourg is my second favorite city in the world after really? Barcelona. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so when you say that it's non-touristy, is it still pretty accessible, though, for someone to go? Or would they really need to be able to speak French? You know, could just anybody visit? Oh, yeah, you can. It's, um, people really make an effort. Um, they're, they're happy if, if somebody comes from the outside. You know, they are not run down by any tourists. So if, if you come and then suddenly speak Spanish or English or whatsoever, they're really happy to help. So uh, we didn't have any issues. That was, was really, really nice. But again, a lot of people speak also German. In Alsace, uh, they have a really deep German influence as well. So yeah, for me, it was very easy to understand. Right. Yeah, but no, it's, it's definitely very accessible. It's not a problem. You will, you will find a lot of people speaking um, English. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we experienced that in Paris, obviously, because there are so many tourists. And so I was curious about how that was once you get out of you know, the major cities. And I love that you brought up that they're very, they're very nice and they're very willing to help because I think, unfortunately, there is a stereotype you know, about the French people. And we did not experience that stereotype at all while we were there. Everyone was so nice and so friendly. We actually stayed at a hotel in the business district. So we were kind of away from the touristy areas. And people were still extremely willing to help us and, you know, get us to where we needed to go and help us figure out how to use. We wanted to send off a postcard while we were there to some people back home. And we couldn't figure out how to use the machine to get the stamps and all of that. And there was this extremely wonderfully nice woman who she didn't speak English really she spoke it you know broken English but she still helped us and you know I was very pleased with how helpful everybody was yeah absolutely I, I think yeah there's, there's a stereotype but at the end of the day yeah it's it's up to the single person to every single person mm-hmm. I only had good experiences so um yeah obviously but I mean um in every city, you can you can uh, bump into one who has a bad day. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that that happens everywhere, not just in Paris or whatever. So 
Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. So anywhere on your travels, have you had any experiences that were a little unsettling or a little bit scary or just kind of made you reevaluate the way that you travel? I was once in in Israel and Palestine, West Bank. I don't want to offend anyone um, with with the names, uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was in Jericho, and there were I was with a friend, and there were those little kids, maybe ten, eleven, twelve years old, and we were just walking there, and they laughed and say hi, hello, hello, and uh, they didn't speak any single word English. And suddenly, I turned around and I saw how they are picking up some stones. And yeah, so so they were throwing suddenly stones at us. And I mean, really big stones. If if they would have hit you, that would have been mm-hmm. injury. So it was like, okay, what is going on here? And uh, so we left, uh, went back to our guest house and told this to the guy. And he was like, well, yeah, so this is just uh, sometimes some, this is what happens. But usually, no, I didn't have any, any extreme, any, any really dangerous situations. But I know a lot of travelers and a lot of, People who have been to a lot of places, lived there whatsoever. And I'm always asking beforehand, is there anything I have to know? And mm-hmm. um, yeah, then they tell you, yeah, hey, um, there is this very common scam for taxi drivers. You know, they tell you, or oh, Marrakesh is a really wonderful example. They say always when you're looking for something, ah, oh, well, I want to go to this mosque. And they tell you, ah, oh, no, no, but this is close. You should visit this. And then suddenly... Yeah, they they want you to pay and uh, they bring you to the store of their cousin and tell you, yeah, now you should buy this, this, this. And, um, but if you know all these things uh, a little bit beforehand, it's fine. It's really, but okay. I, to be honest, I mean, I, I ended up uh, at one point that really worked the scam and I, I bought some uh, mint. So that was fine. I still have it. And so, I mean, it seems like a lot of these situations can be avoided just by doing the proper research ahead of time. Yes, but not always. The first months I moved to, uh, I lived in Barcelona. Um, I got pickpocket, and uh, yeah, that was kind of my welcome to Barcelona. I guess I don't know. Yeah, but once you know how uh, pickpockets work, uh, the thieves and stuff, then it's okay. But still, it's not a guarantee. Right. But it helps, I guess. Well, and one thing I like to bring up is that. I mean, that can happen in your own city that you've lived in your entire life. You don't have to be a traveler, you know, and it, it doesn't have to even be, you know, this, this foreign city that you've never been in. That can happen anywhere. Absolutely. It, it can happen anywhere. Um, but obviously, there are a couple of things you always have to know. Um, when, when there's a really dangerous area um, in, in, in large cities, uh, you should know this beforehand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are those, those funny stories from a guy, actually. I think it was in Buenos Aires in Argentina that he crossed one street or actually it was at a hostel. That poor guy was staying at a hostel and um, actually wanted to meet his his, uh, his hostel mates and uh, they already left. And he asked, so where are they? And are oh, they are this way? So he crossed this one street where he thought he would be quicker, but <laughs> he got uh, robbed. Nothing, nothing really dangerous happened. Just was... I don't know, I guess with a, with, a, with a knife or whatever and said, hey, give me mm-hmm. your wallet. So he gave him his wallet. And that's it. And he left again before anybody else wanted to go home to the hostel. And he took again the very same street and he got marked again. I mean, it sounds very funny. Now we can laugh about it because it, it, didn't, right. happen, it didn't happen anything dangerous. I mean, it was at the end, it was just a couple of uh, dollars. It was okay. So a good way to stay safe is, uh, for instance, to to really ask the hostel reception or in general, the, your hotel reception, whatever it is. I experience that this helps a lot because they know really the city and which streets you should not take or what are the tricks to to rub you. If you cannot wait until you, you arrive, uh, just send an email or check the website. That's That's what I always do. I always send an email. And usually they have a pre- uh, prepared email and send it to you and how to stay safe, uh, how to stay safe in the destination. So, okay, yeah, that's great advice. And so, have there been any locations that you've been traveling around in, not necessarily in this past two years, but just kind of your life in general that was ever not quite what you thought it would be once you arrived, or or maybe was a little bit of a disappointment, or just didn't quite live up to your expectations? 
Hmm. Yeah, actually, pretty. I'm, I'm very sorry, but uh, I have to mention Paris. Yeah. I think Paris is absolutely gorgeous, but I had such high expectations mm -hmm. and it was rainy. It was, um, I did not enjoy it that well, but I'm pretty sure it was also the moment. And if I would go back now tomorrow uh, with some sun and whatever, I would really enjoy it. So for me, it's always hard to judge. It's not always the fault of the, of the destination because it depends on your mood. It depends on the weather. It depends on, on, yeah, on your bank account, how much money you are able to spend. Right, exactly. So, so to judge a destination just by a few days you spent there, it's, it's quite hard for me because, you know, there's a reason why so many people love Paris, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And it is gorgeous, so, yeah. And another destination, no, actually, not that much. I, I, but I have to say this as a, as a Barcelona um, is Madrid, maybe. But, you know, I have to say that. Barcelona, Madrid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's the future look like for you? Do you have a destination already in mind that you're going to be going to next? How long do you think that you'll be living a location-independent lifestyle? How do you see the future going? We will travel to Bangkok at the beginning of December. We will be there for three days and then we don't know. Anna, uh, my, my partner, she just said that she would love to, work, uh, to live in Taiwan for a little bit. And I somehow feel that I want to live in Vietnam for a while. I don't know why. Yeah, how long we can do this? I think if you're location independent, you're not really thinking about this because you're, you're so flexible and uh, you can adapt to a lot of situations. Um, that it's not really necessary to, to think what will happen in five years because everything what will happen in five years depends totally on you. Not, not totally on you. You know, there are things you can influence and other right. things you cannot influence, obviously. But yeah, maybe at one point you will say, no, I'm sick of it. Now I want to have my fixed flat, my home, my mm -hmm. home base. And then you have it again and then you want to sell it again. Um, I don't know. I, I, we will just swing it right now, uh, see how it goes, and uh, meet a lot of people, make a lot of experiences, build up hostel geeks uh, more, and see how it goes. And so one final question for part one. For anyone who is bitten by the travel bug, they know that they want to have more travel in their life, but maybe they do have a more traditional lifestyle right now. They have a flat or you know a house and they have a normal job that they go to every day, mm. but they want to make that change so that they are more location independent. What would you recommend to them to help get them started on that path? I definitely think if, if you want it, you can do it. That sets, sets a base. If you really want to be location independent, uh, you can find ways to do it. And there are in a lot of ways to actually do it. You can do start your own business. Or you can just work, uh, have a look on what you're good at and uh, see how you are able to uh, earn money with this skill or with your, yeah, with your skill on the road, location independence. Um, yeah, I think if you have no idea, if you're listening to this right now and you have no idea where to start, just go to Google, type in digital nomad location independence lifestyle and take it from there. Um, there are a lot of fantastic websites which can give you a lot of great advice. Um, my friend, for instance, Leah from the sweetestway.com, for instance, uh, I'm not sure if actually Nomadic Matt gives advice for digital nomads, but just have a look and Google and ask and read, and then you can see if you can actually do it or not. And that wraps up part one of my interview with Matt from HostelGeeks.com. In part two on Wednesday, we're going to dive more into that business, including just what it is, what they do, how they're helping the travel industry, things that he learned while building that business, and things that he would do differently if he could do it all over again. If you would like to check out HostelGeeks.com or The Sweetest Way, which is the travel blog that he mentioned that his friend Leah runs, or Nomadic Matt, I will have links to all of those in the show notes. You can find those at livingunconventionally.com forward slash episode 107. Of course, those are the actual numbers, 107. 
In those show notes, I'll also have a link to my free ebook that includes over 140 business and travel resources that have been provided by both my guests and myself over the first 100 episodes of this podcast. And there will also be a link to the Living Unconventionally Facebook community. We're edging our way towards 450 members in there now who are sharing pictures of their travels, talking about dream destinations, providing advice, and just generally building relationships with people that are completely understanding of their desire to want to live life in an unconventional way. If you're not a part of this community already and you would like to be, all you have to do is simply click that link in the show notes or just go to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. I look forward to having you back here on Wednesday, but in the meantime, I hope you have a fantastic day.